Um, okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, my name's Justine De Jager, and I'm a member of the board of directors of the First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. Um, and we'll be volunteering with uh, a few other wonderful members of our congregation just to help facilitate the session uh, on the back end. Um, so a quick uh, note on Zoom, um, if this is perhaps the first time you're using it, or even if it's the 10th and it's still frustrating to you, um, just a few things to note. Um, one, I mentioned it earlier, but you can change your name. Um, so if the, your display name is not what you'd like uh, people to see, um, you can click on participants at the bottom of your screen, and then a participants list should appear. Um, and then if you click on your name, you should be able to uh, click rename uh, and change your name. Um, we are doing this session in what we call listen only mode. So um, please, uh, if you have any questions or concerns uh, about Zoom, or if you have questions for the panelists, um, please enter those in the chat function and, uh, and we will get those and we can uh, deal with those and troubleshoot any issues. Um, your audio video settings are on the bottom left of your screen. Um, again, if you're having any issues with audio or video, feel free to message and we can try to work those out with you. Um, but those are where those settings are located. Um, finally, we are uh, going to record this session. Um, so we are going to attempt to highlight the uh, videos of the speakers. Um, so we do recommend that you actually turn your video off such that we can um, highlight those uh, speaker videos um, and ensure that that's what's included in the recording. Um, I think that's it for me. Thank you so much, Justine. Welcome everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm the Reverend uh, Patricia Gusman Harash. You can call me Pat. And I'm the minister of the First Unitarian Congregation of Ottawa. I'll be your host and your facilitator. So thank you for being with us today. Um, as we're recording this, uh, when we're done, this uh, uh, session will be put up with the Capital Pride YouTube. So you can uh, recommend it to all your friends to watch again. Um, and if you miss something, you can watch it again. Um, if you've come for the Capital Pride interfaith panel uh, discussion about uh, welcoming and affirming uh, uh, in congregations, welcoming and affirming LGBTQ2 spirit plus in uh, congregations, you have come to the right Zoom discussion. So welcome again. Um, in a bit, I'm going to be introducing our panelists and they'll provide some remarks and more introduction. And uh, then we wanna gather up any questions from you that you might have uh, for the panel, as Justine said, in the chat function. Um, but first, some opening words, maybe to set the tone. Uh, as we meet together today, we honor and acknowledge that for those of us in Ottawa, the land we walk upon is unceded traditional Algonquin territory, and we are reminded that all Canadians have treaty responsibilities. Like the sacred ground we walk upon, may we treat all who have gathered together in this space that we're sharing uh, with respect. Uh, these words from Reverend Penny Hackett Evans. Each of us brings a separate truth here. We bring the truth of our own life, our own story. We don't come as empty vessels, we, but rather we come as full people. People who have our own story, our own truth. But the virtual space that we share uh, is rich with truth and rich with experience. All manner of people are here, yes? May we all recognize the truth and the story in everyone's life, and may we hear and honor those truths. And with that, I'm just so grateful that we have three speakers who will be sharing their a bit of their life and their stories and their truth. And, um, why don't I go around? Maybe I'll go in alphabetical order. Um, today we have a rabbi by their by their last name. Today we have Rabbi uh, Liz Bolton, 
And um, she comes from Or Hanashima, a Reconstructionist Jewish community in Ottawa. Welcome, Liz. And also we have uh, Reverend Brian Cornelius, who is here from First United here in Ottawa. Welcome, Brian. And we have uh, Fazia uh, Talib, who co-founded the Ottawa Valley Unity Mosque and who I first learned of, I think, through activities of the Canadian Council of Muslim Women and um, uh, always inviting uh, interfaith gatherings and conversation, yes? Yeah? So um, maybe if, if just one of you would like to begin and share a little bit before we open up for questions. <laughs> so I'm a, a, a rabbi in the Reconstructionist uh, denomination of Judaism, um, a second career person. And when I attended uh, my rabbinical college beginning in 1989, I had no notion that it was going to be possible for me to be a congregational rabbi. Ours was the only um, seminary in Judaism that had an open admissions policy. Um, still rabbis in the field and even in our school remained in the closet. Um, so it's pretty astonishing as I'm looking at uh, the 25th anniversary of my rabbinate to, uh, to see where, what the landscape looks like today. So just a little bit of context for, I mean, for, for, um, for queer, for trans rabbis, and for the ways in which uh, my denomination, Judaism in general, have, um, have grappled with the issues of equality and equity for queer people and queer um, rabbinic and cantorial leaders. Thank you. And you also are in an in, in inclusive congregation, yes? Yes, so our denomination actually has a, um, a process for communities to become um, affirming congregations. Interestingly, um, it was adopted, it was modeled on um, a process that the Methodist Church had developed oh. Oh. Uh, in, in the 1990s. Uh, we incorporated some of that work. Um, developed workshops by which um, communities could um, affirm that they were welcoming, which of course didn't just mean, you know, saying it, but then um, embedding certain practices. And I'm proud to say that the first congregation I served as a rabbi in Baltimore, Maryland, was the first affiliate to um, uh, identify themselves as an affirming congregation. Wonderful. Thank you, Lou. And um, I guess, Brian, why don't we keep going around the circle, if you could say a few words. Yes, great. It's a delight to be here. Uh, my name is Brian Cornelius, and I'm the minister at uh, First United Church in uh, Ottawa, situated in Westboro. And I'm very fortunate to be part of a congregation that has been working on inclusion of the queer community for over 35 years now. Um, first United, when the United Church of Canada was really wrestling with the inclusion and um, of the queer community uh, in the 1980s, First United was one of the vocal and upfront supportive congregations in that dialogue. I became associated with the congregation as a, as a person searching in my own spirituality in 1990, which was about, um, what's that, 30 years ago. And... Um, and then I've been the minister at First United for the last 15 years. It was um, in the year 2000, 20 years ago, this coming September, that I came out. So I'm an out gay minister. And First United was a very important part of my spirit journey as I came to terms with my own identity as a gay man. Um, I grew up and was originally ordained with the Pentecostal church. So I grew up in um, an evangelical um, worldview. And that particular church would still not include me as part of their community. So I found a home in the United Church. 
and um, have been celebrating being part of an affirming and uh, exciting and wonderful congregation uh, over the last 15 years. And as a congregation, we absolutely affirm that very core to the Christian identity and message and teachings of Jesus is a community of inclusion. And uh, we have an understanding that Jesus taught, uh, taught us about and revealed God as love, and that Jesus as a spirit person indigenous to his own lands and culture was building a community founded on inclusivity and that this is core and essential to the Christian message. And so we are faithful, not stepping out of the tradition, but we are being faithful to the tradition by being uh, fully inclusive. So I look forward to dialoguing about that more through this time. <laughs> Wonderful, Brian. And Fazia? Oh, her, my, her, she's muted. Just a minute while we get you on. There you go. Thank you, Pat. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, greetings of peace to everyone and good afternoon. My name is Fazia Talib. I have been a resident of Ottawa for over 50 years, and I'm a co-founder of the Ottawa Valley Unity Mosque, which uh, is often referred to as OVUM. And it was founded in 2016 here in Ottawa with the encouragement and support of the El Tauhi Unity Mosque in Toronto. Uh, my journey to being part of this Oven founding community um, has been shaped by, of course, my life experience. I am not a theologian, I am not an historian. And I make no claim to being a scholar or expert in my faith. I am a Muslim by birth, but more importantly, I'm a Muslim by choice. And Islam and the Muslim community has always been part of my conscious being. So my parents uh, were among the first few hundred Muslims to help build the first mosque in Ottawa. Uh, that was almost 50 years ago. And uh, the community of Muslims although they've existed uh, as a community for, you know, in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and indeed the first Muslim to be born in Ottawa uh, was Miss Eva Wahab, born here in um, 1914, and she passed in 2005. Um, it was still a fledgling community of Muslims in the 60s and 70s, um, and we came from dozens of different countries and dozens of different backgrounds, but because we all shared that separation of different countries and different cultural backgrounds, um, we bonded together. And uh, that separation from our places of birth and our, our extended family connections helped us to find comfort in fellowship um, and worshiping together, almost as one community. Um, that was some time ago, and much has changed since then. Today, there are numerous mosques and places of worship and there's some 80,000 Muslims in the city today. Um, these communities all follow different schools of thought and different faith um, expressions. Um, but Islam itself, while not a monolithic uh, um, community, we are uh, monotheistic, but people are from diverse sects and different schools of thoughts and have different relationships with Islam. So my personal journey um, really started about 30 years ago uh, when I became so uncomfortable and disappointed with the patriarchy, the lecturing and the monologues and the constantly being treated as a second class Muslim, primarily because I am a woman. So I became aware of gender inclusivity and of women reclaiming um, our space by leading prayers, by delivering sermons, by defending gender inclusivity with Quranic analysis. I learned from the writings of such scholars as Amina Wadud, she's known as the Lady Imam, and uh, such other scholars um, as uh, Fatima Mernisi, the late Fatima Mernisi, Laila Ahmed, Asma Barlas, uh, Zibat Mir Husini, Aziza Al Hibri, Laila Amariati, Khalid Abu Afadl several others, and from social commentators too, like Mona El-Tahawi. Now, these were all people in 
other countries telling the world how Islam is. And um, my journey, though, towards where we are today started with my awareness of the Salam movement, um, which was founded by Elf Khaki, an immigration lawyer in Toronto and a human rights act act activist. So in 2009, El Farouk, Troy Jackson, and Lori Silvers, Dr. Lori Silvers, co-founded the Unity Mosque. Since then, there have been numerous Unity Mosques established in major Canadian cities and even in other countries. And the intent of the Unity Mosque is creating an inclusive, Tawhidic Muslim identity spirit and, and safe, spa safe prayer space where diversity and inclusivity are celebrated and not just given lip service, where the intent of inherent dignity of every human being, regardless of gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, linguistic group, ability or disability, religion or class, is recognized as Allah given, as underscored in the, hum in the Quranic declaration that Allah is closer to each of us than our jugular vein and without distinction. So those pr principles really appealed to me and they were significant to me. I began to attend um, an annual iftar event that was held here in Ottawa based on these principles. And at that time they were organized by uh, Muslims for Progressive Values and the Universalist Muslims and spearheaded that formidable shala. <laughs> At one of these gatherings, I, I led my first congregation prayer, and I never forgot that feeling, the satisfaction of that moment. And this was surpassed only when I first attended um, a peace iftar in Toronto around 2013, uh, in which I performed my prayer behind the lady imam, Dr. Amina Wadud, who led us in prayer. And in 2014, El Farouk and Troy visited Ottawa and encouraged us to start a Unity Mosque congregation here. And while ours is not a mosque of bricks and mortar, uh, we gather in spaces loaned to us or rented to us by like-minded faith communities and organizations, including uh, Reverend Brian's space. Um, and we've gathered in homes and parks whenever we can to provide a sense of community and peace and healing to those hearts that need it most. Thank you so much. And thank you for lifting up all those women Muslim authors as well. Uh, good stuff to read. Um, I, even though I'm not the main person here, I might as well share a little bit too. Um, I grew up, Unitarian Universalist. I've been so all my life and I'm really old. So that's been for a very long time. And um, I, I just want to say that as part of Unitarian Universalism, I never knew anything but being welcoming and affirming. Um, I grew up in a church where people were going through uh, transitioning. I grew up in a church where the pillars of the church were uh, uh, queer and and so I never knew until you know you hit high school and people are mean and you realize oh maybe other people uh, don't feel the same way and uh, when I went to college and I ended up majoring in religion and then going uh, years later to seminary um, I, I made a study of how how do people use scripture to support hate and exclusion, because I didn't get it. Because the way I was raised, uh, all faiths and, and our own were about love. So it was quite a puzzle, and my eyes were opened, but I still believe uh, at the core that um, uh, faith traditions, uh, you know, that people are trying to be good and, and that love, neighborly love, is really at the core of it. And I think, um, uh, even the, the four of us had talked about how we realized the principles that, that we feel so strongly in our own faith communities really can be found in so many different places. It's not just exclusive to Brian's community or Liz's community or Fazio's community or mine. 
uh, you will find it all over the place if you look. So that was just um, one thing I was going to say. And, and for us, we have uh, principles that most Unitarian Universalists agree on. And the first principle is, is the dignity and worth of every individual. And it doesn't say every individual except it really says every individual. And that's just I, I, part of my bones, I guess, is the way I would say it. Um, and what I so fiercely try to support. Uh, first you um, in Ottawa and also the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship in Ottawa, we're on the east and west side, um, are welcoming congregations. And as had been said before, there was a process in the Unitarian Universalist congregations, even though it kind of was part of us from the beginning as far as I was concerned some decades ago. Uh, uh, after I was older, we started to have a formal process where people could be, uh, uh, could, the congregation would go through a process to state positively that we were welcoming and, and affirming. So um, I don't see yet a question. Are there, uh, uh, would folks like to send out questions? Did you put it on the chat? Uh, anything that, um, you would like to ask now that you have an opportunity to ask anything just about of a, a clergy person oh we got one so i got a question here um and this really each of you uh could uh, take a turn at this question um for those of you who may or may not be aware uh christianity judaism and islam are called the abrahamic traditions because they all see uh, have Abraham as a, a father. There are similar scriptures that uh, we share um, or, or have looked at in our own way. And so let me ask you the question, um, and, and each of you can take a turn. The question is, how do you help trans queer members create personal spiritual connections uh, to the community or to the religion when we aren't reflected in the traditional cis hetero narrative that are celebrated in Abrahamic religions? Oh, that's a good question. Um, do you want to think about that a while or is anyone ready to dig right in? Brian, do you look ready to dig right into that one? Well, I think Liz should probably go first on this one. Well, you mean because of because of the evolution of the Abrahamic traditions? Is that yes, correct? something like that. <laughs> oh, thanks a lot. Sure, fine. So let's start. Um, let's start at the very beginning. <laughs> well, well, in fact, the very beginning actually is where I do want to start, and that's in um, in our canon, um, uh, variously called the Hebrew Bible or the Bible or Tanakh. Uh, or Torah. So um, I, I think perhaps what the questioner might be alluding to in part is that our very canon has been used as a cudgel, has been weaponized, that the sacred words of, of our texts have been used to cause significant, serious, and prevailing harm in the name of, of holding up the tradition. So it becomes uh, imperative right from the outset to wrestle with the canonical text to wrestle with the sacred text um so one one thing that i i love about judaism is that it's it it's understood that there is not one meaning to any given text to the sacred text comes inherently with layers of meaning so one meaning uh could be um sort of in what context was it created? And it can go all the way over to mystical layers of interpretation. So without delving too much into that, I would say a primary task of a, a clergy, whether, uh, uh, whether or not they're queer like I am, uh, otherwise connected to uh, our, our uh, approach to Judaism, is not to hide and cover up and try to excise those damaging texts but to, um, to look at them carefully and with an understanding of the harm they've caused and providing other avenues of interpretation. Um, 
Uh, we love the text. There was a text you alluded to, uh, Pat. Um, I believe it was the uh, that passage from Leviticus that somehow goes around the whole circle of the community of religions to love one's neighbor as oneself or treat others as you wish to be treated. Well, we hold that one up, but we certainly don't hold up the um, you shall not lie with. And I'm, I'm not going to sort of quote, quote the whole text. Um, but as I said, I, I want to go right back to very briefly a text right at the beginning of scripture. And that's the creation of human, because the questioner also talked about the, the apparent binary and the reinforcing, even in thinking, uh, trying to make our patriarch egalitarian with the matriarch and talk about Abraham and Sarah, then we're still talking about that kind of normative heterosexual model. When we look at the verses about the creation of human beings, I contend that it actually suggests that they were created in the divine image. Both look, looking at the, the Hebrew text and, and looking at what is actually said, that a human that embraced all the expressions of gender um, was the first human. Um, so I'll just, I'll just leave it there and uh, look forward to hearing from, um, from my pals here on the panel with some further thoughts. Yeah, if I could go next, um, I think uh, Liz really said pretty well everything that I, I, I would want to say. Uh, I, I'll highlight two things. Um, first of all, whenever we talk about the Abrahamic tradition, that is the way that it's talked about in the scriptures, but we have recognized that we need to um, use much more inclusive language. And um, so I'll often talk about the orthodoxy between the orthodox, um, that there was an inclusivity that is part of the spirit of the original intention of the sacred wisdom in the texts, and that we are more faithful when we include that. So we don't want to talk about, we talk about Sarah and Abraham, and we include all of the, uh, when, we, when we talk about um, all of the women who are part of the tradition of birthing um, our, our tradition. And that also then goes into the life of Jesus, who was surrounded by women, but we tend to only hear about the men. And so we recognize that there is a patriarchal prejudice in the text, but to be faithful to the pre, uh, patriarchal, to the tradition, we have to challenge the patriarchal prejudice by getting underneath the text. And that's where the text that Liz has um, um, lifted up, the original creation text, and there are many other texts like it throughout the Hebrew scriptures and the Christian scriptures, which point to something more, uh, something that may have even been somewhat silenced, um, like the Sophia wisdom of the Hebrew scriptures. and. Um, uh, uh, which is then captured in the life of Jesus. So I remember reflecting on the um, creation story and titling my reflection, They is Good, because that captures the meaning of the text. And, and that's why, you know, as a faith community, we would say that if we're faithful to our tradition, we cannot help but be inclusive, because this is what comes from the very heart of the sacred comes from the heart of God. And so really struggling with these texts and dancing with them. And then you begin to see other texts differently. I, I would suggest that there's a lot of uh, intrigue in the Jonathan David story. I would suggest that there's a lot of intrigue in the way in which John the Apostle is talked about. There is a, a wonder to the Naomi and Ruth story. And so we may not be so herto as it has been interpreted. And so, um, and, and the Midrashian tradition of the, uh, of the Hebrew people invite us to play and be imaginative with the sacred stories because that's what touches our own stories. We bring our own stories to interpretation. It is as valid in bringing our own stories and then seeking the wisdom that comes from the text. So I think Thank you so much. Fazio, would you like to add? Yes. Or I, I, your piece. Yes, I <laughs> echo uh, the um, words that have been shared by Brian and by Liz in that uh, at the Unity Mosque, we are also re-examining the traditional texts. 
um, so in addition to uh, looking for those layers of meaning and looking for the new, um, new or, or different ways of looking at what we've been traditionally taught and the stories that have been traditionally related, um, we have endeavored to look at the, the meaning of certain words that are traditionally um, translated in a particular way and looking for the numerous ways yeah. in which they, they can have meaning and interpretation. In addition to the, the language and the storytelling, physically, we provide a space that promotes equality. Um, it is a gender equal mosque and an LGBTQ affirming mosque. So uh, we embrace a compassion centered vision of Islam and that celebrates diversity and the concept of shared authority and equal divine agency for all gender orientations. So we welcome Muslims and non-Muslims alike and we provide a, that safe space for everyone to um, express their own understanding and experience without telling anyone else that they're wrong. So it's my Islam rather than a singular or monolithic uh, Islam. And if the Unity Mosque is informed by many different schools of thought, by Sunni, by Shia, by Sufi, and other Muslim and non-Muslim non traditions um, are both to make a positive social impact uh, and to um, create that space in which uh, people, feel space, people feel safe, um, people feel brave enough to share, uh, where their confidentiality is respected, um, and where the different diverse understandings of Islam can be expressed, examined, turned over and reflected upon and, uh, and thought over and done so in a, a way that's um, more a dialogue than a monologue. Um, and, and it's, you know, expressing the, um, the questioning of it. So recently uh, we observed the Eid al-Adha which is traditionally the Eid of, or the festival, uh, marking the end of the Hajj. And of course, this year, it was a unique uh, occasion, as was the previous Eid uh, at the end of Ramadan. Um, and this Eid is often uh, marked with a congregation prayer, which we did this year uh, for the second time, um, using uh, the Zoom or social media platform. And um, the sermon we heard focused on uh, the life of Hajar, which was the handmaid um, given to Abraham to have a, a, a son. And um, the whole Hajj is really centered about Hajar. And Hajar is searching for water to sustain her child between the two mountains. And that is a significant portion of the Hajj, um, I'm told. I have not been to the Hajj myself. But uh, that, that story is so often forgotten. And a lot of the traditional uh, tellings uh, or sermons around um, the Hajj is, is focused on the story of Abraham and his uh, offering his son um, in, in, in sacrifice to uh, God. Uh, as a way of showing his piety, um, but forgetting the importance of the role of Hajar and the role uh, and her, her identity as a single mother, as a, um, a, a, almost a, um, a, a mother struggling economically and, and, and physically and emotionally. And um, there was a lot, of, a lot of fodder, a lot of things that fed I think our congregation from that sermon and that interpretation of that sermon, uh, that interpretation of that story. We have similarly um, re-examined, you know, traditional interpretations or, or translations, meanings of uh, the, the uh, opening prayer, the Al-Fatiha, which is heavily, traditionally heavily with um, uh, translating uh, God as um, uh, 
someone with a gender. So in the Unity Mosque, uh, there is no variety, there is no gender associated with God. We will use she or he or it. And um, we suggest uh, gender neutral and non feudal origined words. Uh, for, for example, the word rabbana is a sustainer, nourisher, or cherisher, not lord. And the word taqwa um, is being God conscious rather than God fearing. We also suggest that inclusive language be used um, and therefore request that people use words like brother and sister not use rather not use words like brother and sister but rather folks people siblings beloved similar gender neutral words and in the sacred space we pray what's called meccan style meaning we don't impose any sort of gender segregation as you would see at some of the traditional mosques we gather together physically and congregants stand next to one another, however they wish and however they're comfortable, and dress however they're comfortable. So um, where you may be told at some mosques to, uh, as a woman, to, um, would you like to cover your hair? Um, we, we do specifically say, you know, don't do that. And um, we would prefer that you don't. That, uh, in fact, um, we all come with our own understanding of modesty, uh, according to our own experiences. And that if someone is not modestly dressed in your opinion, um, re we refer you to the uh, Islamic injunction to lower your gaze. Um, so this means that the mosque doesn't require anyone to uh, cover their hair or dress in any particular way. And it's more about the cleansing of your heart and the feeding of your soul. Thank you. So I, I thank you so much. I go back to the original question. How do you help trans queer members create personal spiritual connections when we're, we aren't reflected in the traditional hetero narrative? And what I love from all these responses is, well, maybe you didn't learn other things. Maybe you weren't in a space that was open to engaging in those stories in a different way. And just because you were taught in a, a, about a cis hetero narrative, that doesn't necessarily reflect what's all really there. And I think that's the other thing that I hear in what each of the panelists said, they're not layering over something that's not there. Within the sacred text, you find that maybe it's not what we were taught about those cis hetero uh, narratives. There's much more to the story and you can tell all of us have fun engaging in it. So that's, that's one, one way to respond. Um, uh, oh, Liz, did you have something quick? I was really inspired by, uh, well, for, by what both Brian and Fosia described and I'm thinking of, of two things um, in response. Um, one, uh, Brian, you alluded to the wisdom uh, tradition. So I immediately flashed on um, in the book of Proverbs in chapter 8. Uh, it, it pretty much says in the text that woman was wisdom, the, the figure of woman wisdom was there before creation, before everything else. So again, um, and, and Fazia was talking about the like the attention being paid to how we name uh, uh, sort of the sacred presence and in addition, therefore, how, how we name each other. So my goodness, um, even in the text, there's a hint of, um, if you will, a feminine divine, which you might then suggest, oh my gosh, are you telling me that there is, you know, that it didn't all start with God? Well, again, so it's all about wrestling uh, with those impulses in the tradition. Uh, the other thing that, um, Fazi inspired me to, to reflect on was how in the spaces um, we address not just how, how we sit, um, you know, how we dress and really meet, meeting people where they're at, but that that concept actually comes from the, who, the, the, the story of the person we call Hagar, 
And oh. there's a phrase in um, the book of Genesis chapter 21 that has sort of the divine presence sees Hagar um, and tells, tells Hagar that the divine presence sees her son Ishmael where he's at. And, and this phrase, I, I mean, that's a translation of the biblical Hebrew. It, it doesn't say where he's at, but um, Ba'asher Husham. And that's in a way, I think what all of our communities and certainly what our community strives to do is to meet people where they're at in, in the spirit of, um, of welcoming openness. Yeah, if, I, if I could just add to the, Ooh, Brian. Yeah, the, 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 the Hagar story is one that's also very significant in, in our faith tradition too. And so I think when we, that's why when we come to language and inclusive language, we'll often talk about the faith of Abraham and Sarah and Hagar uh, to make sure that we're including the whole stories because many stories have been overlooked, including a lot of the prophetic teachings and so certainly third Isaiah talks a lot about the inclusion of the foreigner and the sexually marginalized. And it is actually very explicit. And that was never lifted up for me as a child. And those, <laughs> that, that tradition, that Isaiah tradition is also then reflected in the narratives of the early Christian community, especially in the um, baptism of the uh, Ethiopian eunuch. Um, you have these reflections of that, a very prophetic tradition that was stepping outside and challenging its own tradition. And so you always have to remember the, the sacred texts are in dialogue with one another. And, uh, and so that's what makes it them even more fun, um, you know, so that you can dance with the texts. And, uh, and the invitation of the spirit, especially the Sophia wisdom, is to dance not to bow down to, but to dance with. Beautiful. Um, Rabbi Liz, I just have a quick question. Um, someone had missed when you said in your intro that you have had applied to a particular rabbinical school because they would take anyone, maybe even me, if you can just quickly share why it was the maybe even you, yes? I guess I, I, I lied there. So in 1989, um, when it dawned on me that my path uh, was not necessarily to stay in the classical music business where I uh, was earning my living, um, but I had that call to the rabbinate, there was only one rabbinical seminary that had an open admissions policy for queer applicants. Only one Jewish seminary that would graduate somebody who was queer. Um, that changed subsequent to our seminary's decision. They made that decision in 1985. Um, in the 1990s, other denominations of Judaism followed suit. So the expectation in those denominations at that time would have been that I would have had to be in the closet and somehow I mean, it, it was inconceivable to me because I'd never not been out. Um, but very specifically to ask somebody who wanted to learn how to be a spiritual leader, to ask them to sort of quash and hide their sexuality while trying to, you know, kind of truly spiritually investigate where they are and how they want to walk in the world. So that that's really the specifics of why uh, um, that was the only place. In addition, the Reconstructionist approach to Judaism, Reconstructionist theology absolutely resonated with my being and, and where I stood in the world. So it was just a great match all around. Also, my entering class Thank was you. eight women and one man. Oh. So, uh, and in addition, through, as, as things have progressed and evolved since the late 80s and early 90s, all of our institutions, our summer camp, our youth programs have also addressed issues of uh, gender expression and identity um, so that there are, um, you know, a, a gender neutral and inclusive approach even at our summer camp with our children and our youth. I'm particularly proud of that. Very cool. I just loved it when my, my own son 
went to a summer camp and he came home and he said, mom, mom, everybody else is talking in a gender inclusive way too. And it was a gender neutral and whatever. And I said, so very cool group, very cool group. Anyway, so I knew I'd raised them right, right? As our Unitarian messages had gotten out. So um, here's a question for everybody. Um, do you have any suggestions for how our, and I'm presuming our faith communities, can demonstrate their authentic allyship to visitors? And specifically, I wonder how the faiths that you represent are dealing with minimizing homophobia. You know, I guess how you make your message clear, I suppose. Anyone want to take that? In some ways, perhaps you've already addressed some of that. Um, I think Fazia, the way in which you talked about inclusive language and inclusivity in prayer um, and other things, but any other uh, input about how we make sure, there we go, what do you got there? <laughs> well, it, it may not be entirely visible, but it's one of the, um, it's a poster that the denomination offers for us to kind of add to our art in the same way that it's really important for us. No, I should say to those who are um, uh, watching and listening uh, that Orhe Neshama, Ottawa's Reconstructionist Community, actually meets at First Unitarian uh, in that building. So while we don't have our own building, um, we do have a, a space that we can decorate and this sign is in it. Um, this synagogue honors the divine image in every human being. Um, you are respected, appreciated, and warmly welcome here, whether you are Jewish, Muslim, Christian, Hindu, or any other religion or no religion, transgender, non-binary, cisgender, or anywhere on the spectrum of gender identity and expression, gay, straight, bi, or anywhere on the spectrum of sexual orientation, a person of any racial or ethnic identity whatsoever, a person with a disability, whether visible or not, a person who was born here, who has moved to live here, or is just visiting. And, and I think those and other aspects of visually messaging, sort of what, what can be present and what should be present and understood, even if that an individual representing that group isn't in the space in that moment. I think that's one, one piece of, um, what the question is looking for. And if I can just share too, you made me um, go look for our, every time we open up our service, we say, whatever your heritage, whatever your faith, whomever you love, and however you identify, today you are a part of our spiritual community. And I think, um, so right up front and right in the vestibule is, uh, the rainbow flag and, uh, you know, it, it, to just put it right up front, right? And make sure people know. Um, Brian or Fazia, is there anything else you'd want to share about how to help? Besides the fact that you preach about it and, and you go to the Pride uh, Festival and you, uh, you make sure you're present where you should be present and you stand up for what you should stand up for so people know, right? But anything, anything else to share about how to make sure folks who visit folks in your congregations know what you're about, right? What what you feel strongly about in being inclusive. So I, I would say, I would say that, um, you know, yes, indeed, we, we um, do try to be visible everywhere we can. Um, we are a volunteer driven organization as so many are. And, you know, most of us have other jobs <laughs> and we do this in our spare time. So it's not um, always um, uh, possible for us to be everywhere that we would like to be or that we should be. Um, but whenever the opportunity does come, uh, the network does, you know, band together. And um, we, we keep, you know, furthering our reach through social media has been great for reaching out because it provides almost a safe space for um, people to come forward who may not be uh, comfortable doing so in their own communities. 
And in those communities that continue to exist, those um, traditional uh, places of worship, you do have to allow them to carry on. They, uh, they come with their own perspectives and experiences on the faith and the stories. And, you know, it, it's, it's either their hearts will be opened at some point or maybe they never will. But we have the freedom to, to create our space and to keep building and evolving that space, that both the, the spiritual, the mental, the physical space. Um, and uh, to grow from that. So we do um, use a, a, an etiquette at the beginning of our, our events and our services in which we do, do go through um, some of the things that I've already mentioned about, you know, how we, um, how we assemble and how we will pray, how we will dress, um, and very similar language to what I've already used. Um, and we we do recognize uh, the indigenous lands we occupy and the injustice inflicted upon just indigenous people and our our desire to make amendments uh, we do um you know include environmental consciousness um and we try to embrace a healing merciful uh, and compassionate forgiving islam so those messages appeal to some won't appeal to uh, um, everyone uh, we try to be very inclusive. We try to um, reach as many. And, and so sometimes uh, we will get feedback that we will consider and incorporate. Um, I mentioned the two Eids that have passed. Uh, we partnered with like-minded organizations, um, one specifically based in the United States called the Muslims for Progressive Values. And we were able to have an amazing um you know eid congregational service um that included representation from five continents um so just amazing to to behold that and had it not been for the covid situation we're in i don't think we would have been able to um to have that to be able to celebrate and observe in that way and and uh have that sort of reach and influence. Um, who knows, we may have, but it, it forced us to find a way to chat. And uh, it was, I have to say, alhamdulillah, thank God, very successful. Um, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Brian, you might have something to add, but also I'd like to tack on a question for you because this was specifically to you. Okay. Um, so it's, and I think they're kind of related, but um, so think about in your package what we just were discussing, you know, how to make sure people know uh, uh, they're welcome and, and how we're minimizing or fighting against homophobia. But this question was directed to you, like Reverend Brian, I come from an evangelical Christian faith tradition, but as an adult also found a new home in the United Church. Before COVID, I attended a service with my mother at her church. I walked out during the sermon because its entire message was, in fact, to argue against LGBTQ, right, at a United Church. And so they asked, what more could I or should I have done? It's kind of tough, huh? Yeah. yeah. Um, I would have done the same thing. I would have walked out. Um, the United Church is not monolithic, um, and so there are different congregations who hold different positions, and it is part of our polity. The uh, United Church of Canada as a denomination is quite clear publicly on the full inclusion of the queer community. So I don't allow myself to be um, abused. Um, and that's, I, I use strong language. Um, because I find when someone is using the pulpit as a place um, to, to, um, to denigrate, um, I, short of standing up and arguing with them, choose to exit. Um, sometimes I might stay, depending on, on the nature of the person, and if I knew that there might be an opening for dialogue, um, I might do that. Um, I guess maybe in 2020, my patience is a little less than it used to be. 
Um, for me, I'll often try to say, and I think this will come back to the other conversation that I, I, we were having. For me, talking about the inclusion of the queer community is so last century. Um, you know, like, really? We're still talking about this? Um, I recognize that there's much work to be done in the same way that talking about Black Lives Matters still matters today, even though slavery was, you know, abolished in the 1800s. So, so there is considerable work to do. But, but part of me also wants to not necessarily um, uh, get hooked into our old arguments, but rather work on how we are embodying and living new new faith communities. So when it comes to how do we create that space, we do have the verbal and nonverbal cues. Um, sometimes it's kind of nice to say nothing and rather have it be the assumption as of, of the norm. And then second, and then but what I find most exciting is when you can visually see it embodied in the congregants. So when same-sex couples feel comfortable and safe to hold hands, and to put their arms around each other and when their children are there with both parents and the more visible we are in uh, um, just being natural having created a, a legacy of safe space allows the queer community to say this is a place i can touch another and feel comfortable uh, appropriately of course but um you know, that, that, that finding ways that we actually embody it in our bodies, as well as in what we say and all of our non-visual cues. So, and I don't know if I got to the um, other, other person's questions completely and be happy to dialogue about that more. It disappoints me when I hear of that experience in a United Church now. I mean, that grieves me um, to no end. Uh, I find that a very yeah. great grief. We're, we're also somewhat um, become a bit of a refuge. Um, it, not so much within our denomination, but from other Jewish spaces. Um, so, you know, and, and finding that balance for when and how to dialogue and when and how just to say um, that's causing harm. Um, so there are several really amazing organizations in the Jewish world in North America that are um, addressing the kind of situation that the questioner described, it, you know, from our communities, um, providing safe havens um, for folks who were brought up um, ultra-Orthodox or Hasidic um, Jewish households and sects um, who don't necessarily want to maybe um, reject their um, spirituality, but can't stay there because of their sexuality. It's called Eshel. Uh, and there's another organization called Keshet, which is the Hebrew word for um, rainbow. Uh, it's like our flag that provides lots of guidance and materials to communities who may um, nominally be progressive or small L liberal, but still struggle with all of those decades, as, as Brian said, you know, kind of so last century, uh, that, that some of those social mores and individuals with the congregation may still be struggling. So to have tools and safe spaces for those conversations that need to happen to explore it without causing harm in the community. Thank you. Um, I think these two questions came from the same person, and I think these uh, kind of come out of, um, uh, not the, the last question, but these two questions I'm going to say, I think came from the same person. And I think they kind of are a place we're moving to. One part of the question is, it was someone who left Catholicism in part because they were gay, and, but now has learned of some queer positive Catholic group that we are trying to change from within. And so how do we work in solidarity with groups in less affirming congregations, not just Catholic ones? And, and something you said, uh, uh, Liz, is, is what I think of is, is help them find the material within your own denomination that are welcoming and affirming and get them to them and talk about your own experience 
and even some of the things we're starting to share, who are the uh, scholars, Catholic scholars out there who are more in their language, inclusive, and talking about these stories that we're lifting up. That's one, one part of your question, but there was another part that, that, that may, again, I'm thinking it's the same person, but maybe not. I'm currently part of a non-affirming Pentecostal congregation. So it was exciting to hear about Reverend Cornelius's experience with charismatic Christianity. Despite the doctrinal indifferences or, or differences, I presume they wanted to say, I have with my denomination view on the LGBTQ uh, plus community. I really do feel like I have a place and a purpose to fulfill within this uh, community of faith. Do you all have any words of encouragement for people of faith who choose to continue to worship in non-affirming environments? Any way to help buttress this person? Um, I think maybe I'll, I'll, I'll give a shot at that. I, I would say, good for you. Um, I, I wanna completely affirm that choice. Um, it was a choice I even wrestled with at just one point, whether or not to stay and be involved in, in, in change processes. And it what didn't work out for me at that time. Um, I do think that there is a cultural shift that has occurred over the last 20 years that is very significant, which actually holds a great opportunity within the more traditional evangelical or Pentecostal circles. And I know of some communities that have actually become affirming. And so um, the spirit is amazing. And, um, and I, I'm a spirit person. And so to actually believe and to trust in that. So I always encourage people to listen to their own inner wisdom, to find, um, to, to be in the place that feels right for you and, um, and to find the judicious and prudent ways in which you are able to be a witness in that space. And perhaps always to make sure that there are some other supports outside the community that if you have a really bad day, or it goes bad that you're able to keep grounding yourself so that you can really be present in that, in that community. So finding those other supports. So, so I wanna completely affirm that choice because that's in fact how it changed. Um, the United Church wouldn't be where it is today if it were not for all the gay and lesbian and allies who stood strong through the 60s and 70s and 80s in order to create that context. And so this is your calling now. And so that's affirmed and I wanna be, be completely behind you on it. Um, being loving and affirming is infectious, right? It's kind of hard um, if, if that's just your way towards other people, right? To complain about that. I do wanna make a clarification. I'm so, uh, as a person wanted to make sure you knew it was her mother's Baptist church, not a United church oh, okay. that had the, Okay. Good. That, that the makes me is, feel better. <laughs> to make, so you can feel better. I want to yeah. do one more my, my, question. I'll, I'll just say topic. to that, my mother always invites me to her church and I just choose not to go. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, and I think this one might be especially for Fazia to start on. Um, and I think we all, uh, you know, sometimes when I say a minister, among a group of new people, they just don't even know how to respond, right? Uh oh, should I put my drink down or whatever it is, right? So here's the question. Um, how do we challenge the narrative within queer and trans communities that religion or religious practices, uh, such as choosing to wear the hijab or uh, to engage in prayer or even to just be at church, right, is inherently anti-gay or anti-trans, and I'm sure, Fazio, you really have to battle that all the time to say, no, we are inclusive, yes? Yes, yeah, we do, um, you know, keep reaffirming uh, what we are about. And I have to say, you know, I I'm on a journey of uh, learning and developing and growing uh, my, my own understanding of the LGBTQ community. Um, so I've been blessed to be able to ask the questions when I'm in, in uh, conflict or in doubt and 
uh, uncertainty at the at times of uncertainty. I've been blessed to be able to ask those questions, and and I think that is the key of providing that space that is safe for um, uh, for those things to be discussed and for those things to be um, addressed. And yes, there are areas in which you you cannot win that battle you won't be able to persuade someone so you you deal with what what you are able to deal with because we all have our different um capacities whether of knowledge or our own emotional capacities to deal with the the challenges we face in life and uh the unity mosque and the the uh community of like-minded Muslims are here to provide a that safe space. So uh, the expression Allah loves us all is at the heart, it, in, in fact, the bedrock of the Unity Mosque. Um, and it's the prominent message you will see uh, when we participate in the Pride Parades. Um, we strive for uh, an Islam rooted in liberation and justice um, and in the freedom to find our own way to Allah in whatever way we are able, whoever we are, whoever we love, we can indeed be queer and Muslim. And sometimes it takes a lot uh, to journey to that, that place where we can affirm that not only in a public forum, but even privately to ourselves. Um, from those, for those of us who have been raised in very traditional, um, traditional ways of of observing uh, the faith, but um, creating that that opportunity, that space for safety, for learning, for growth, is I think how um, one of the ways we can tackle this. There's a part of thing. There's a part of that question that I'm really interested in, um, and that's. That was the aspect about representing a faith in sort of secular and possibly even progressive spaces. Did I did I understand that that part of the question? Sort of how is it? How do we bring um, not just acknowledgement but sort of the, the legitimacy of being a queer person of faith into the queer community space? And I'm just going to expand that just sort of generally in activist circles or in you know progressive circles or civic culture there's that tension and i think for some secular folks it's because they are they've also been fed a very patriarchal and limited perspective on what religion and what god is and i want to be able to enter into dialogue and say well um that's a God I, I don't really have anything to do with or, or, or believe in. Um, we've shaved God's beard, knocked God off the throne, and there actually is no throne and um, nobody to shave. Um, no. So it, it also becomes a question of asking for equity and respect in those secular spaces for this approach and this kind of religious expression. Yeah, yeah I, I, I would add to that if I could. Um, um, often when I'm in a, in, a, in a queer setting or in a gay bar and somebody asks me what I do, it's often a conversation killer. Um, but, or it adds more intrigue. And um, so being able to, to talk about that and to express <laughs> that um, is really important. And so, but I, uh, I fully understand why that reaction exists, because I fully do understand how traditional religion for a very long time harmed. And so I'm not judgmental of that reaction at all, but choose to engage right. because people, um, People express spirituality in many ways and many outside of institutional church. And I have lots of commonality with them. And so I love celebrating the multiplicity of the ways in which people give expression to their sacredness. And um, so if I'm lifting up someone's sacredness, I'm not doing an apology or for who I am or for what I stand for, but I get again to dance with them, to say, here's what we have in common. And um, that's very liberating. Yeah. 
in, Thank in you. And I think, um, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. So in addition, there have been um, opportunities at, uh, you know, at scholarly events or, or conferences, religious conferences, in which um, the, uh, the mosque has been invited to participate and to present that perspective to a, a larger community. And it has let, I, I don't, I hate to say it, legitimacy to uh, the, the mosque and, and the values of the mosque. Um, so for instance, there was, uh, I think it was called the, the World Conference of Religions uh, in Toronto, um, maybe two years ago. Uh, and we did have uh, several opportunities to run workshops, participate in workshops and, and share these views. And it opened maybe some eyes and some hearts uh, of uh, others in the Muslim community and who, who were previously not aware of, of this. And it has also um, maybe built some bridges uh, amongst uh, like-minded communities um, or strengthen ties with like-minded communities, providing us the, um, the platform, the um, sounding board, the opportunity to share uh, who we are, what we stand for, and um, raising the awareness of others. Sometimes it's, it's as simple as that Pride Parade, I think, is one of the most amazing events I have ever attended in terms of reaching out to other people. And I have to tell you, last year uh, when I participated, I've only participated in a handful, two or three of these pride parades. Um, but last year amongst the people, you know, I saw uh, someone from um, my nephew's high school who was there dressed in his, his regalia. He does not dress that way, who's Muslim, by the way, he does not dress that way in the school environment. Um, and the uh, other thing that happened was this young woman seeing our signs, seeing the sign prominently saying, Allah loves us all, um, came over to us and came over to the one of the one of us who was holding that sign and said, Can I just give you a hug? I needed to see that. I needed to hear that. And that does lend a lot of uh, legitimacy, encouragement to uh, our struggle. Thank you so much. You know, I'm recognizing the time. There are a couple of other questions, um, but we did want to respect the time. I do, um, I'm, I'm going to highlight one of the questions that remains, because uh, I think it's a, an excellent point. Uh, someone asked, does the whomever you love, which was part of our, what we say in the opening of our services that I read, does the whomever you love kind of language, <coughs> excuse me, such as love wins, etc., go far enough? I'm wondering if it recognizes the persecution people face for sexual practices, not just love. The reality is trans and queer sex workers and others are excluded because of sexual activity, not love. Um, are our faith communities prepared to be explicit about diversity of sexual lifestyles beyond just monogamous gay marriage? I know I can speak for Unitarian Universalists that in uh, recently polyamory amory was a struggle. However, I would invite you to go to the Canadian Unitarian Council's website. And if you have trouble finding it, there's a, a wonderful in-depth uh, statement regarding polyamory. Uh, but I think you will find in, in especially amongst us, uh, progressive voices in our denominations or um, others, you'll find that this is something um, we do want to open our arms to and be accepting of as well. And, uh, and we still are working on each other in terms of being, uh, making sure people understand how inclusive we mean to be and um, how welcoming we mean to be. Um, but an important um, point to bring up. Um, I'm sorry we didn't get to everybody's questions. Um, and uh, I, I, I think we should wrap it up. One of the things that Capital Pride really wants to make sure is that every year they have something from the faith communities 
to really battle against this impression that there aren't welcoming and affirming uh, faith communities, to battle the impression that uh, we each, uh, there isn't a home for everybody, a spiritual home for everybody, because I can tell you, probably all of us feel there is a spiritual home for everybody. And it may not be my home, but you're welcome and try it out, right? But we do believe that there is a spiritual home for everybody. Um, so this this was recorded. It will be up on the Capital Pride uh, YouTube site. You know, if you have friends who are discouraged, maybe uh, just hearing us talk about this will help to encourage them. And and I do believe on Sunday there's going to be another event. I think um, from a Jewish perspective, I'm trying to remember if there's other events, but I so appreciate all your questions. Thank you so much. We're going to, as we end, um, we're going to put up contact information for each of our congregations and communities. Um, we're also going to hear a song from um, uh, Abby Bettini's, who likes her music used in justice ways. And um, this is uh, performed by our musical director, our Service last Sunday was our annual pride service, and all the music uh, came from from queer folk. And so this is one of the ones we'll feature. Hopefully we can uh, play it for you. And I am so grateful to Brian and Liz and Fazia for, for sharing with us. Thank you so much. These are three people I've admired from afar. I'm so glad that you were here with us. So why don't we um, play the music? and show our contact info. Maybe this is a beginning of conversation, not the end. And um, have a really good day. So take it out, my tech people. Thank you to my tech people. Love, love, love. All we need is love, love, love. All we need is love. Bye now. Bye -bye.